Hey Dojo friends, I had a lot of questions since the last video about the Super Guard and how they're made about the parts of the Guard. So I thought I'd do a more detailed video on what the parts of the Super Guard are and what the purpose of them is because there are purposes to these holes. Many parts of the sword had actual function underneath the beautiful craftsmanship. So let's take a look at the Suba Sword Guard in detail. Over hundreds of years of Japanese warfare and in the culture itself, Suba artisans soon produced ornamental styles such as this. And these became, in some ways, beyond the life of the sword, family heirlooms. Most of these designs that you see reflect mythology, legends, customs, religion, and the artistic side of Japan. Today, a lot of these Suba guards are now collector's items. I have a collection of these and they're beautiful in their own right, even though the swords that these once adorned are long broken, gone, lost in fires, etc. Knowing the parts of the guard and appreciating the craftsmanship might inspire some of us to start our own collection one day. Even though the sword is long gone, these are still collector's items, and you can collect these as I have over the years. And knowing the history and the characteristics and what the purpose of these are, might inspire you to start your own collection one day. There were many people that went into making different parts of the sword, such as the saya, the scabbard, the handles, the wrapping, the blade itself, and the metalwork, such as the habaki, the kashira, the different collars, the guards. Those were called shiroganeshi. These were craftsmen who worked in gold and silver and all different types of metal alloys to make these beautiful adornments. Now these are very nice guards, but there are far nicer ones in museums around the world, and they had different types of craftsmen that they have judged over the years to be different levels, just like you have martial art teachers, you have martial art students, you have martial arts instructors, and you have martial art legends. Well, the legends in these areas were called Meijin. Meijin were superior master craftsmen, and Many of them had signatures on guards such as this, and these would take months to make each one. So you had a Meijin, a super craftsman. You had a Meiko, which was a great master metal worker. A Joko, which is an excellent artist. And a Ryoko, which is a good artist. All of them good, but you had different levels. I don't own any of the ones by master craftsmen because they would be almost priceless. The prices to buy super guards are anywhere from $200 up to $20,000. It really depends on what you want to spend for the craftsmanship and the historical significance. So the guards were made of different types of metals and alloys. They would mix them up and heat them. You had different types of sword guards such as these. They're different shapes and sizes, really depending on the era, the purpose and the artist's soul or will. This black one here, this is called Shakudo Suba. Shakudo literally means black gold, and that's like a copper alloy that contains small amounts of gold, at least 4%, and the metal combination gives kind of a jet black or blue-black color, sometimes called crow's gold, and that refers to its resemblance to a bird's plumage. A Shibuichi-type Suba is more of a brownish color, and it's harder than the Shakudo, and these contain silver, they can contain copper, lead, or zinc, or even tin. And when treated, these surfaces have kind of a brown or a gray color versus the black shakudo. Here I have just four different types of sword guards, but there are many, many, many more. A lot of them were round or elliptical, disc-shaped, um, but some had rectangular shapes. But here's a marugata. This is a super guard that's completely round with the holes in it. You had a moko gata, and gata just means a shape. A moko gata is kind of this shape. Can you see it here? This has kind of a four lobed handguard shape. So it's got these lobes, one, two, three, and four underneath. This was really good to protect the hand in battle. This is a really interesting shape guard here. So you have round, you have oval, you have square, you have the moko, you have kikugata, jujigata, tate, yuko, kobushi, the list goes on and on, aori. There's so many types of sword guard shapes out there 
again, depending on the artist, the history, the period of time where you're going into battle, how expensive did you want the guard? Was it in the Edo period, the peacetime, where they became more decorative? Speaking as a martial art and Kenjutsu teacher, I prefer a guard that is just stronger kind of iron. The ones that can be too decorative can be a bit risky from the opponent's sword stabbing through or hitting your hand. I want a sword guard that's big, that will cover my hand. Some of the smaller ones I don't find quite as practical in Kenjutsu because my hand has been hit. I'd rather have a big, beefy guard than a small decorative one made with soft alloys. So the craftsmen created guards using silver, gold, even colored stones in some of these. Some had really elaborate cutouts called Tsukashi Suba, which could be positive or negative silhouettes. But again, are we looking for design and decoration? Are we looking for maximal functionality or just, you know, how, how it looks, aesthetics? And again, I think that in the Edo period, a lot of these guards became less made for battle, of course. It was a peacetime and more for decoration and perhaps for the richer people in society who just carried the sword as a honorary piece. But just because a guard is plain, it does not mean that it is not functional. So here, this plain piece of iron, square, is really good at protecting your hand, perhaps better than a smaller guard, which is much more nice, like this one that has beautiful gold paint on it, but maybe too small for the opponent's attacks. Every part of these guards had thought and functionality and beauty put into them. The edge, the edge, this is called the fukuden, this is the outer rim, and even the edge sometimes was shakudo or sometimes was colored in gold. The rim of the suba, the mimi, sometimes you had a rounded rim. Uh, this is a flat one, a hira, but none of these have a raised rim on them. So you have a maru mimi, a round rim. You have a dote mimi, which is one that's slightly raised. You have a thicker raised rim called kan mimi. Kaku mimi is a squared rim. So sometimes you see the guards that are flat, like this hira, and sometimes they have a raised guard here which could be etched out or added later, and sometimes they were adorned with gold or etching, but they knew that these were gonna be worn, so a lot of the times they're just plain and flat. As you saw in the last video I did, sometimes they etched out, called zogan, these are the design inlays made of brass or copper, and these kind of pop against the black background or the brown background. Often they would carve these out and put in copper on top to raise these levels up to make them really stand out in a 3D form. Now the sepa are the washers that go over this. This is called the sepa die, and the sepa die is the flat base around the tang hole, and that seats the washer here. And as you know, sepa are on both sides of the super guard, and these washers help for packing and tightening the space. They could also decorate the front and back of the suba, I don't have sepa with me here, but they would sit right here and here, and the sepa would cover up the mei, the signature here. So looking at this old handmade guard, let's look at the different parts. The flat part is called hira, and those of you who do our martial arts know we have something called hira no kamai in taijutsu, and that means the flat surface. So this is called the hira here. The word for hole is ana, A-N-A. -A. Ana means hole, so you have different holes, and each of these have a function. The nakago ana, the nakago is the tang. Obviously, that's the, where the sword blade passes through in the middle here, and then the sepa go around. So that's called the nakago ana. And then a lot of people didn't know this, but you see how the different holes are different. You have one that's round here, and one with an additional cutout. Do you know why they're different? That's right. One of them is for the kozuka knife, and the other is for the kogai. So this is the kogai hitsu ana, or the kogai bitsu, same thing. This is where the hairpin could come out without the sword being unsheathed. 
And over here on the Uda side, close to the samurai, is where the kozuka knife would be. Now turning this around, which is the way it would be held in my hand, the more decorative part is out showing toward the crowd or the people or the opponent. And then inside here, you would have the kozuka side on the Uda close to your body and the kogai side on the omote by the kurigata on the outside. Makes sense. If I have a kozuka knife here against me, let me show you with a sword. If I had a kozuka knife here, it would be against my body, and this little hole is where it would slide up to grab out and either throw or just use however you're going to use it to cut meat or something. And then the hairpin side would be over here in the scabbard. Most swords don't have that anymore because it's really expensive to carve the saya out and why would you want a hair piece? We don't use them anymore. We don't have longer hair. So I have the knife side and the hairpin side. But isn't that cool to know that these holes, just by the shape, have a different function to them, all three of them. The tang, the knife, and the hairpin. All designed so that you can squeeze them out through the guard without unsheathing or unlocking your sword. Isn't this stuff so cool? And some of these guards, like this handmade one of butterflies, look at that beauty here often had two sides that looked exactly the same. So, you know, you had your functionality was exactly the same in the shape of the design itself. In this heavy snake one, there's a hole here, but no hole over here. This ogatana here in this shape has a large, huge cutout for the utilitarian tools on either side, and they're both the same. Here's another guard where the relief itself was equal on both sides, holes on both so that you could get your utilitarian knives out easily. And here's a very modern Subaguard with no holes in it, which is quite common nowadays because they're easier to stamp out or make. Old records indicate that the hairpins, I don't have one with me, but I'll bring one in one day. I have a couple. They were used for scratching your skin on hot days. They were used for sticking your loose hair under your headgear, under your helmet and in some cases even to clean your ears. And the Kogai hairpin was also used to arrange your hair back in those days. This is the hole for the Kozuka knife the samurai used. And those knives, again, I'll bring one in from my collection, they were used perhaps for cutting wood, for cutting up game or meat, um, perhaps attacking the enemy in an emergency. I have thrown these as shuriken, they do stick but I think that they're more used for utilitarian purposes and not necessarily for battle. But of course, you could throw your knife secretly, pulling it quietly out of your scabbard without the opponent knowing, and throw it at them as a distractor or a shuriken so that you could move in quickly with your sword to finish the job. Some sword guards such as this had extra holes. Here's two little tiny holes at the bottom. These are called Udenuki-ana, and these are for a cord to pass through. Perhaps the sageo, or just a lighter cord here, might have been here to tie your subaguard closed, almost like a, um, like a safety measure on a pistol. Perhaps you could secure the cord and tie it here in the kurigata so the sword couldn't be taken out. So sometimes you see them with small extra holes to put cords through, perhaps to tie your sword on your back, to put it, hang it from a tree to dry, who knows, who knows, but you can see, it's hard to see, but there's two little holes drilled here. And sometimes swordsmiths would plug the holes, they're called ume, ume are the metal plugs that they would plug up the holes, perhaps for decoration or aesthetic purposes. Now this particular sword guard I gave to my student Matthias Hilpert's wife, who is Harumi, who is a native Japanese speaker, to look at these kanji and interpret them for me. She researched and found that this guard was made by a smith, and I have the notes here. His name was Ishiguru Masayoshi. And Masayoshi, she wrote, uh, was born in 1771, somewhere into 1851. He died in 1862. According to this, he was a student of Ishiguro's school founder. He worked as a retainer for the Shimazu Daimyo at the Edo compound. 
Masayoshi is one of the most famous masters of the Ishiguro school. Other masters included Masaki, Masahiro, Masachika. And here are the kanji of his signature he carved here, which would sit under the seppa toward the swordsman. He had artistic names. This is interesting. His names were Juga Kusai, Juga Kusai Juo, Juo Sai, Judo Sai, Shozo. And again, this piece is signed Ishiguru Masayoshi Hori. And she wrote that the Hori character is seldom used in his signatures. Here's another subaguard of this beautiful butterfly that was signed by another smith, which we'll look at another day. Isn't this stuff interesting? Who knew that parts of the sword, like the guard itself, could have so much reverence, so much craftsmanship inside of this one little thing that protects your hands from sliding onto the blade and protects your hands from being hit by the other opponent. Again, I find as a martial art teacher that it's my job to research this stuff and make errors and find out new things and kind of go down these rabbit holes of learning about one little part of one little weapon, which is part of our huge martial arts system. There are entire collectors and experts. I am by no means an expert on these, but there are people who collect these and spend perhaps hundreds of thousands of dollars to add these to their collection. And yet they probably can't use a sword, but that's not the point. Collecting and beauty is in the eye of the beholder, the eye of the buyer in some cases. And these Suba guards are literally works of art. Pieces of history, the craftsmanship, the weeks, the months it took to craft these, the different metallurgy, the different chemicals. Who wore these guards, if ever, on their sword? And what did they do? And where did they go? And who did they kill, perhaps? Did the sword underneath this guard ever see blood, or did it just see the light of some museum? The beauty of our imagination is that we just don't know. We weren't there, but we can imagine most of the time, untrue, where these things went, how they were made, who saw them, how they were passed down from generation to generation, and how do they end up on the internet, on eBay in some cases, to be bought by some schmuck from Ohio. It's so cool how human nature is to collect things, and then when we die, they go on to the next generation, and often we lose the history and the story behind these beautiful Suba sword guards. Thanks for watching everybody. I appreciate your time and we'll do more things like this that are the deeper side of martial arts and Kenjutsu. I'll see you soon. Thank you for watching. Bye-bye.